So I think uh, a lot of our viewers are probably familiar with you as uh, the founder and uh, president of the People's Policy Project, which you started in, I think, 2017, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so we, we had tons of questions to ask you about some of the like white papers and policies that um, you know, you've been designing. Um, however, before we get to that, I would like to briefly talk about something that is going on in the news recently, um, because I think that lots of people uh, are interested to hear what you have to say about it. And it's that uh, Neera Tanden was a few months ago uh, nominated by Joe Biden uh, to head the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Neera, you know, is a prolific tweeter, and that has caused her some trouble in the confirmation process where it now looks like her chances of becoming the OMB director are quickly tanking. Uh, West Virginia's Joe Manchin, uh, you know, has recently come out saying that he won't support her nomination. Um, I don't think it's likely that any Republicans will. And um, I wanted to ask you about it because you Prior, prior to Neera Tanden even being a kind of twinkle in the OMB's eye, uh, you had had a pretty well-known run-in with her. Um, and I bring it up because it also has to do with tweets. <laughs> <laughs> you did and this before it was cool, too. That's you did right, this before yeah. it was you are, cool. You are a hipster in this regard. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just wondering, for, for people who aren't quite caught up on what happened and why you knew about Neera Tanden before anybody else, what happened? Uh, I mean, the short of it is that in the 2015 primary, we kind of mixed it up a little bit because she was for Hillary and I was for Bernie. Um, I was one of the few people in the think tank world that was for Bernie, um, at least publicly. And uh, we got into a spat at one point. Uh, the genesis of this weirdly was a piece that Joan Walsh wrote at The Nation saying that, you know, Bernie's supporters are just, you know, all white men and and how she she wants to support the candidate of women and people of color. And I'd respond to Joan, uh, well, you know, it's actually, it's really an age thing. You know, young people of color support Bernie more than Hillary. The same thing for young women, the same thing, you know, all, on and on down the line. And uh, Neera Tannen jumped into the thread at one point. So I, this is important context because I didn't come at her. She came at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't remember the precise details, but the, the tweet that got me in trouble was, uh, I, I, you know, I was going on about welfare reform, welfare reform, because uh, Hillary Clinton was part of that. And so was Neera Tannen because she worked in uh, the White House under Hillary Clinton. And uh, Neera decided to defend herself by saying, well, you know, I was on welfare. So, you know, sort of like, how dare you, uh, you know, accuse me of being bad on welfare when I, uh, when, when I was on it. A, a kind of a twist on the usual, like, uh, uh, well, I have an identity that uh, privileges mm -hmm. me in this respect. Except or for I have black identity. friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> except the identity is I received welfare <laughs> instead of like, I'm a woman or something like that. Which, um, not to out you, you also have that identity. Is that, isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and that was clear in the thread as well, because I was talking about my own uh, situation. Um, but uh, so I, you know, I just said, uh, you know, scumbag near uses welfare when she needs it and takes it away from others when when they need it, which was a reference to a scumbag Steve meme, which was a thing at the mm -hmm. time, but not not anymore. I um, recall that. And uh, it, just, it just went off from there. Demos fired me and put out a press release saying I was a really bad guy. And uh, then I lost my other job at the NLRB for uh, related reasons. Um, and uh, that's why I now have my own think tank. <laughs> <laughs> Where you well, can call whoever you want, scumbags. Yeah, no more boss. Right, now you can go off on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, okay, so there's kind of two follow-up questions then. Um, so I've seen a lot of people sort of saying like, uh, uh, you know, well, Nira, Nira totally sucks, but we, we don't want anyone to be fired because of tweets. And as somebody who was mm -hmm. in, the, in, in that situation, I wonder if you agree with that or if you're kind of just like, hey, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Because that's kind of like, when it comes to her now, that's kind of my take, right? Um, but then the follow-up question is, there are obviously, since, I mean, you alluded to this when you spoke about welfare reform, there are obviously reasons to oppose Neera Tanda's nomination that go beyond tweets. So talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that's the sad thing that they, she's living and dying on uh, what she said about 
uh, Republican members of Congress, um, which, you know, that's not the ideal way to take her down, you know, uh, mm-hmm. it would be better to point to her record. You know, um, the most recent event was in 2010 when Obama was pitching uh, cuts to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid as part of a grand bargain to, you know, balance the budget. Uh, she, Cap came out and she came out, went on TV, went on C-SPAN, you know, went, went out and was promoting this directly. And I remember in one of the uh, interviews she did, she even uh, decided to mention, I know some of my progressive uh, peers, they don't like that I'm, <laughs> I'm out here doing this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with Nira, it's sort of hard to say, like, what does she believe or what does she not believe? Because um, in that case, you know, she was just carrying water for Obama. Uh, before that, she was probably just carrying water for Hillary. Um, you know, she's an operative more than anything else. But in being an operative and kind of going with the the flow of the Democratic Party over the last 25 years, that flow has been very negative in a lot of places. And so she's she's got the same negative track record as the Democratic Party more generally. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully that little clip doesn't go viral because some Republican takes it up and says, even socialists, know, like, although they have been saying oh, she's getting a lot of hate from the left. But I think the left is more concerned with her record, like you said, and less concerned with her t- Twitter profile. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as a practical matter, you know, what they're saying she's going to do at OMB is she's kind of going to be like the budget negotiator for the president, you know, in Congress. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I actually think Joe Manchin has an interesting take on this, which is, well, she's supposed to come up here and negotiate the budget with us. And she's burned all, she's just pissed everyone off. And no no Mm -hmm. one's like, how's that going to work? Like, that actually (laughs) kind of makes a little sense. But um, but aside from that, I don't know if I'm uh, someone who has the kind of grievances and grudges she has against the left, which are very kind of personal in nature, not mm. just, I don't know that she has super strong policy ki- commitments, but she's committed to the establishment of the Democratic Party. And as a result mm-hmm. of that, she has generated a lot of just just antipathy and, and, and just grudges against Bernie and all the rest of it. And so, uh, you know... When it comes to the cutting room floor on the budget, I don't think she's going to prioritize what Bernie might want to put in there, you know, as a, I don't know, a, an extra $5 billion for community health centers or something. She might say, mm-hmm. well, we got to cut and, you know, I don't like him. And so, uh, yeah, there are totally legitimate reasons to think, well, maybe it would be, be better to get someone in there to do negotiations who doesn't just, just hate the left on a kind of visceral level. Yeah, that's very sound. Um, I wanted to ask you about another um, kind of topical policy recommendation that's come up in the past few weeks, which is Biden's inclusion of an earned income tax credit for um, families to help get with the stimulus bill. Um, And you've criticized that a lot. And I was wondering if you could take us through why you criticized uh, that kind of tax credit for providing benefits is it particular to the pandemic? Do you disagree with it on its face in general? Um, why is it such a bad idea? Yeah, so I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this a couple, maybe last week. But what I was kind of getting at is in Biden's COVID, uh, COVID proposal, the $1.9 trillion proposal that they're kicking around right now, one of the interesting things he does is he takes the child tax credit which currently is not available to most poor people because they don't earn enough money to receive it. And he makes it available to them uh, for one year um, and will pay it out monthly and all the rest of it. And I've been proposing something similar to that for for a long time. Um, You know, I won't get into the details of why that particular policy is different. But what I thought was weird is he says, hey, it's not fair that the child tax credit, that, that we don't give the child tax credit to poor people. You know, if anything, poor kids need it the most. And it's like, that's very reasonable. But there's another tax credit that is just another child tax credit. It's basically child tax credit 2.0, but we call it the earned income tax credit. And it functions mm-hmm. exactly the same way. And so it's, you know, the piece was saying, why don't you include them as well? Like, why don't you take the earned income tax credit and do the exact same thing you're doing the child tax credit? 
And then the piece I, I lay out, you know, why that why it's so bad, you know, for the same, for among other things, right? If if you don't earn enough money, you don't receive the benefit. That is disproportionate mm -hmm. racial impacts. Like fifteen percent of black kids don't receive the EITC. Only five percent of white kids do. Um, and and the other point, and this is a sort of like not just a disproportional, you know, race, racial disproportionate point, but the other point is that benefits that operate like that that you can only receive if you earn an, enough money. They empower bosses and people who hire and fire to not just decide whether you can receive your wages or your health insurance or whatever else they control, but they also effectively control whether you receive this benefit. You know, um, so this actually got cut in part of the edits, but I, I, I was kind of going on a, a little bit of a riff and saying, like, we know that uh, when people are hiring people, if they get a resume that has a black sounding name, they're uh, much less likely to call them back than if they have a white sounding name. And that's one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is usually twice the white unemployment rate. But what we don't think about is when uh, the hiring manager looks over you because the because of racial bias, implicit or explicit, uh, the government then kind of kicks you in the stomach and says, well, now you also don't get the earned income tax credit because you're mm -hmm. not working. Um, and so I don't know, I try, try to kind of connect that to saying, if, if we're now a woke Democratic Party and we worry about structural racism and that sort of thing, it's sort of weird to acknowledge that people are not getting hired because of their race and then also say, if you don't get hired, you don't deserve benefits because you're lazy, you know? Mm -hmm. I, want to I don't think they're that woke yet, but... <laughs> right, that's the next phase. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to quickly add another point about the EITC, which I can't remember if you've talked about this before as well, um, but because the EITC is a benefit that's kind of submerged in the tax system, people don't really understand it as a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So people, so it's kind of the opposite of like Trump sending out a check with his face stamped on it. Like it's like a government program that no one thinks of a government, no one thinks is yeah. a government program because it's so hidden within taxes that people are just like, oh, this is my money. Like I got my money back. Um, um, yeah. Can I add to that, Jen? Because there's a book called um, It's Not Like I'm Poor, How Working Class Families Make Ends Meet in the Post-Welfare World. Great book. Highly recommend it. Um, the authors talk about how the earned income tax credit has a special status with people who see themselves as like the worthy poor, right? It's not a handout. It's more like a, a reward. It's a benefit for being a worker and a taxpayer. And for them, personally, it doesn't have the same stigma as other types of welfare benefits. But then the authors go on to show that it's really not a social safety net program for all of the reasons that you outlined, Matt. Um, and that it do does very little in the long term to help these families, but it enjoys popular support because it seems like a, a little... Uh, t like a, <laughs> a reward for being a taxpayer in a certain income bracket. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the EITC, the way it's designed is is really negative, uh, aside from the, the sort of racial points and like the hypocrisy points. Uh, among other things, 22% um, of people who are eligible for it don't actually receive it because it's complicated. They don't know. Because uh, mm -hmm. these are people, because you can receive it even if you don't have tax liability. So there's a kind of conceptual mm. confusion that people run into where they go... Well, I don't owe tax, so I'm not going to file tax, which okay. you're allowed to mm -hmm. do. If you don't owe it, you don't have to file it. But you have to say, well, no, no, you want to file it because there's this benefit you get, even though you didn't pay any tax. And like, obviously, I mean, you're already too far gone for a lot of people mm -hmm. to understand. You can get it. Wait, I'm getting a tax refund for taxes I didn't pay. And it's like, yeah, I, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> um, and so there's that problem. Uh, and then, and I know that book you're talking about, Catherine Eden, and, and I, I've had some run-ins with her over the years about this because- uh -oh. <laughs> More internet kind of, strife. <laughs> she, she ends up kind of being a bit of a partisan for the EITC because she says essentially that, hey, it is a benefit that a lot of poor people get, not the very poorest because they're excluded, um, but you know, people who are kind of right around the poverty line are eligible for it. And they don't feel bad about it in the way that people mm -hmm. feel bad about getting food stamps or Medicaid and whatever. And so she kind of sees that as a plus. And I try to push mm -hmm. back and say the only reason they feel bad about receiving those other programs is because they're so targeted. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we had made this program available to everyone, such as through a universal child benefit, 
then they're not going to feel bad about it either. Like people don't feel bad about getting the social security check. They don't feel bad yeah. about getting their Medicare. They feel bad about getting these really heavily means tested programs because they're stigmatized. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel like she, she doesn't go far enough in, in reasoning through like, well, wait a minute, why am I trying to overcome the stigma? And is this the only way to do it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so I actually was going to ask oh. you about that. <laughs> but you already answered it. So go ahead, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just going to follow up on that by asking you to talk a little bit about um, the People's Policy Project's Family Fun Pack, um, because this, I think, is kind of an example of a comprehensive way to not just get at child poverty, um, but to also help parents kind of across the income spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Talk a little bit about what goes into the family fun pack um, and why actually specifically why you call it a fun pack, because that's the opposite of like tax credit, like dreary tax credit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a very uh, that, that's been my uh, the biggest hit of anything we've put out so far, uh, in part because the name is probably fun. Um, but I put that out ahead of the election, hoping I could convince some people to adopt parts of it. And I did. I actually got Bernie adopted a few of the benefits and even uh, Gillibrand actually adopted one of them. Uh, talked mm. to her staff about it. Um, I missed hers. I had yeah, it. well, she was in she was in and out in about two weeks <laughs> right. of the campaign, so <laughs> didn't help her win unfortunately. Uh, well, you know, fortunately or not. But um, what I wanted to do with that paper was I wanted to kind of make a full-throated, here's the social democratic case for these benefits. I don't want to talk about, well, some kids are poor and they need benefits. It's like, okay, sure. But like, what's going on? Why are there so many poor kids? Like, what's the deal? Um, and the answer I give in the paper is I say that there are, if you look at the structure of the economy, right, you have basically two problems that appear with kids. The first one is that kids need resources, but they obviously, they can't make any income, right? That seems very obvious, but like people don't think about that, I guess, because we're so used to thinking, well, there's sort of the parent's responsibility and their parent makes income. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's all well and true, but uh, you know, a, a parent that has like four kids is very different from a parent who has zero kids, even if they're otherwise identical. And the state- I just think, the, I just yeah. think kids should still be working in factories. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when, when did we become a country of handouts? There actually was a politician, I forgot who it was, but he was um, praising a boy who worked as a janitor in his school to earn down his school lunch debt. I don't yeah. know if you remember Newt that. Gingr Newt Gingrich, in the, it was advocating in the 90s, is, having uh, kids, poor kids do just the janitorial real work. Piece of garbage. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're but, but anyway, so there's that. So there's that aspect of it, right? It's just and to say, I don't know, in a sense, kind of think like kids are like little disabled people, <laughs> or they're little retired people, and they need benefits, just like disabled and retired people receive benefits in order to kind of make this all shake out. And then the second point was that when you look at, uh, you know, fertility, when what is the window of fertility, you know, it's roughly like, uh, you know, I don't know, what 16 to 40 or whatever. And well, that's not high earning periods, right? Like your high earning periods come in your late 40s and your early 50s. And so people have kids when they're at the lowest level of earnings and the kids also don't bring in any income. And there's your problem. That's why you get so much poverty and inequality when you're dealing with families with kids. And I thought like make that full throated argument instead of just talking about helping poor kids. And then you can see why the universal family benefits that exist in other countries make so much sense. Because every family who adds a kid deals with financial stress because they now have to spend you know thousands and thousands of extra dollars, but they don't get any money in. Um, and so from there, I'd say, okay, well, what should the benefits be? And frankly, I just kind of copied the benefits from Northern European countries. So we get when you have a, a kid at birth, they give you a baby box, you know, with like, uh, uh, whatever, uh, like, uh, clothes and pacifiers and bottles and whatever. And that's fun. Um, and then you get paid leave, of course, then you get free childcare or heavily subsidized childcare in the paper. I say, just make it free. Uh, you get free school lunches, free health care for all kids, right? You could do Medicare for kids as a kind of stepping stone to Medicare for all if we can't like get it all done. Um, and you get a child allowance, a check every month for the kid, just like a, a disabled person receives a benefit or an elderly person receives a benefit. And, you know, you go on down the line and you just kind of copy those benefits. And once you do that, you know, child poverty is going to shrink to, you know, four four percent, three, four percent. Uh, you know, that pretty much handles that. But more than that, it helps everyone who deals with this thing, right? Because even if you're making six figures, you have a kid, daycare costs 20 grand, that's not an easy thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. But if you could spread the cost of daycare out across all of society, 
then it becomes a lot cheaper. And you don't, and more importantly, you don't get punched in the face when you have a kid. You know, it's spread out across your whole life. You're paying the tax, you know, every year. Yeah, I think one of the figures for the cost of, you know, raising a kid is like $250,000 um, over the course of their life. That's a lot of money. Um, typically, people are told, well, don't do it. Or <laughs> um, people delay having kids. There's a lot of uh, women who wait to have kids until they're much older, which comes with an increased health burden. Not that they have um, difficult pregnancies necessarily, but they are screened much more heavily. Um, they have um, a litany of tests that they have to go through. I think it's called a geriatric pregnancy if they're over 35. Um, wow, well, that's all it takes to be geriatric these days. <laughs> for a woman, yeah, okay? Right, right. A man is geriatric at 95. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's really shifted how Americans have decided to have kids. And you see this over and over again with people putting it off um, when they don't want to. Some people say this is a good thing. It's good for climate change. I disagree. I don't want to live in a world where first or developed nations and rich countries have people who choose to not have kids to save the climate and then every other country where you can't make that choice has to ship in their care labor to take care of us when right you, well right that's the key old. is like uh you know i mean you can talk about what's the appropriate level of population i suppose but uh we're all going to be too old to work one day and the only way that works on a society level is if you have some people who are who are not too old to work and so yeah. It's it's part of us. It's part of living in a society. You can't, you know, you, you go to extinction, and and even before you go to extinction, things start collapsing very quickly if you don't have uh, workers, right? I mean, we know yeah. that as a socialist, that's sort of our whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that is our whole thing, and you see this in other countries that are struggling with declining birth rates, that are putting in place um, measures to try to encourage that. Sometimes it's giving people paid leave to have sex, which I think is happening in Japan. Um, other times, which, you know, that's fine. That's a demand we can add. <laughs> um, and other times it's a, exactly the policies that you've outlined that have worked so well in other countries. I like to tell people that I have kids because I'm not a free rider. <laughs> I'm paying into the Yeah, you're just the reproducing the pot, workforce. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so I, I want to switch gears slightly um, and talk about something else that the People's Policy Project has been working on, which I find really interesting, which is um, looking at the racial wealth gap and specifically, um, specifically, specifically, I guess, challenging or um, uh, engaging with the ways that people think about the racial wealth gap and what we should do about it. So the racial wealth gap is like super hot right now, by which I mean, you know, everybody's concerned about it from people on the left all the way to Bloomberg philanthropies. Um, and so... And it's kind of just taken as this given that, you know, this is this is sort of the um, best example of the ongoing disparities between black and white America, right? Because the median household of like white families last year was something in the like hundreds of thousands of dollars, whereas the median income of black families in the US uh, last year was like 20,000. So there's this huge and vast disparity. Um, but you have recently looked at that and you've come to a slightly different conclusion or you, you have an interpretation of how we should be thinking about that. Um, what is that? Yeah, actually, uh, I actually came to this conclusion in late 2017 because that's when the think tank started. And one of the things I wanted to do was let's do a reparations paper because, you know, none of the other think tanks are going to do that. Uh, and I started, you know, crunching the numbers and like figuring out, you know, just kind of basic level. Let's go into the wealth survey, see what we can do to like make this work. Um, and then I figured out like pretty quickly when trying to figure out what, you know, how to do this policy that, well, you know, actually all the wealth is held by pretty much like the top 10%. The top 10% of white people own 75% of white wealth. The bottom third own nothing. And then, and then you, and you say, okay, well, that's very interesting. On one level, this will, that's going to make this a lot easier <laughs> because you just got, you know, there's only 10% of them. You just take their wealth, spread it out, you're good to go. And then you go and you switch to the, to black wealth and it's like, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> 75%. And then I start doing all sorts of other cuts. What about Latino wealth? What about college educated wealth? What and you see the same thing over and over again. The top 10% owns that 75% uh, of the wealth of that group. Now the group still have different amounts, right? So, you know, black wealth is just less of it than white wealth. Um, so being, you know, owning 75% of less wealth is still less, right? The gap is still mm -hmm. there, but 
the distributions are so weird and the way that we would normally think about it that it's sort of hard to think about how exactly would, the, would we fix this because you could think about two basic ways of doing it right one would be to say well we're just going to grab you know however much white wealth we need you know and then and then just pay it out equally to black wealth and you know to bring the things together and then you say okay well but if you do that there will still basically be no black people in the top 10 percent of society or the top five percent of society uh because the top 10 percent of you know they're not receiving very much of this benefit right like so because of the way it's distributed and and then also on the flip side like the the <laughs> the i don't know the, the poorest black person would be wealthier than like 75 percent of white people <laughs> at that point because like you know that's how much wealth like that's how that's how big the gap is and i don't know that just seems strange i don't know like is it the case that you know but for slavery and jim crow that uh, there would be no black people in the bottom two thirds of society like that. Like something's gone off here. Um, and then the flip side is you would say, well, we could base it. We could kind of scale the payments to the wealth of each group. Right. So we would we would just bring the bottom 10 percent of black people up to the bottom 10 percent of white people and the middle, fifth, you know, the middle 10 percent of white people up to the middle 10 percent of black people or vice versa. And. But then, if you do that, you're paying 75% of the pay of the reparation payments are going to the wealthiest 10% uh, of black people, and then like the poorest 10% of black people aren't receiving much of anything, and so you kind of cut in this double bind, right? Mm -hmm. Either you pay the reparations out to everyone, and then, you know, like like I said before, the poorest black person is wealthier than the bottom two thirds of white people, and you still don't have any really rich black people. Um, or you pay it out in this graduated way, and almost all the wealth is going to the wealthiest black people. And it's like, I don't know how to, I, that doesn't seem to be a way through that. Um, so that yeah. I kind of gave up on it at that point. Well, so I want to, I want to follow up quickly, because I think that um, two of the scholars who work a lot on the racial wealth gap, and I think actually both advise the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, that's Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton, one of their big proposals is something they call baby bonds. So mm. that's, that's you know, for anybody who's not familiar with that, that is basically a government run or like a public trust fund that everybody who's born in the U.S., regardless of their race, so this is not just for black people, um, but everybody, every child that's born basically gets a trust fund from the government that they can access when they're like 18 or 21 or whatever. Um, and, you know, they can use that money to further their education. They can use the money to put a down payment on a home um, or, you know, start a business or whatever. And this idea that um, I think Hamilton and Darity sort of put forward is that this is something that can help close the racial wealth gap. It's universal, but it's also race conscious. Um, do you have any thoughts on that proposal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I think uh, I think they they're very clever in the way that they describe it. If you actually look at the proposal, it's a proposal to give eighteen year olds like a big check, which is not a bad idea, but it, <laughs> they're very smart in being like, it's for little babies, because you know, people are maybe, <laughs> they're, not the as, <laughs> they're not as keen on the idea of just, uh, but like, you don't get it till you're 18. It's like, it's a sort of a fictional account in the government until that point. Uh, so that's, that is one problem though, because the way that they have it set up, people won't start getting benefits until 2039 and like, like, I don't know, like, is they going to survive 18 years uh, before anyone gets a single dollar from it? Probably not. Um, but if you put that aside, um, you know, it's a fine program, I guess. I think it's, a, I think some of the restrictions that they put on how you spend it are a little bit weird. Like, well, you can use it on a down payment. Like they're trying to basically make you put it into assets because they don't want mm -hmm. you to, to spend it because then it doesn't close the wealth gap, right? If you spend it on consumption. But as anyone knows, if you buy an asset, you can then sell it, right? So like, it's sort yeah. of an, you know, well, okay, I, I can only buy, I can only put a down payment on a house. All right, I'll go put a down payment on a house and then I'll go resell the house. Now I have the cash. Like there are parts of it that are a little bit strange in that regard. Um, but the other, the biggest thing is just that they're pitching this as closing the racial wealth gap. And what they're really talking about is closing the difference between like the 50th percentile uh, white family and the 50th percentile black family. And it, it doesn't even really do that, um, but it does bring those two families closer together. But the important point is here is that the 50th percentile, like the middle of the white wealth distribution owns almost no white wealth. Like the middle fifth of the white wealth distribution owns less than 3% of white wealth. And the same thing for the middle fifth of the black uh, wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. So you're evening out or 
starting to even out the gap between two groups of people that really don't own much of anything, like yep. of the of the overall pie. And it works because fi- people love to fixate on medians, medians, medians. They don't like mm-hmm. to look at the whole distribution. And so you can kind of snow people a little bit, but like it's not that is not reparations as far as I'm concerned. Like you're going to have to up the, up the number like a hundredfold, a thousandfold maybe to even get close, you know? I wanted to ask one, one last question before we let you go. Um, one of the other policies that you've suggested is to create a social wealth fund that would pay out yearly to people. Um, I wanted to ask what effects this would have and you know, why you, what you envision this policy doing and also how that's different than at like a UBI program. Yeah. So, you know, as socialists, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, you know, we, we're not keen on the idea that having uh, 10% of people own 75% of the wealth and this sort of small group of people who own all the assets and not only own the assets and kind of have control over them, but also receive a lot of income from owning the assets. About one in three dollars of income in the country is paid out to people who simply own things like real estate and stock and bonds and that sort of thing. And so one answer to that question, which I'm kind of keen on, and which, uh, you know, there's a sort of, it was a big thing in Sweden in the 70s, was to say, well, why don't we just, since most of the assets are these tradable assets like real estate and stocks and bonds, and we know how to create funds that own these things, like kind of separate from individuals, why don't we create just one big fund, have it buy up everything, give every person one share of ownership in it, and then pay out dividends to everyone. And so in that way, we can capture uh, this uh, one in three dollars that currently mm-hmm. is being paid to essentially the top 10%. We can capture these one in three dollars and spread it out to everyone. Um, and that's the basic gist of it. And Alaska actually has a program that works exactly like this called the Alaska mm-hmm. Permanent Fund. Um, they pay out checks about, depends on the year, but it could be as much as two, three thousand dollars a year per person. So for a family of four, that's uh, what that's eight to twelve thousand uh, dollars that you get in a nice little check, and it comes directly from just stuff they own, you know, mm-hmm. dividends on Apple stock and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, and that's like that's not the end state, obviously. Then once you own it, you want to start maybe making changes to the way the con- companies operate and that kind of thing. But that's the basic idea: is using finance and these sort of fund mechanisms to socialize the ownership of of capital. Mm-hmm. We had like 50,000 more questions to ask you about the yeah. PBA and nationalizing fossil fuels. And we didn't even get to that. We didn't even talk about how you're from Texas. Um, but we'll save that for a future episode since um, I think you have to go now. Um, but Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, dishing the dirt on Nira, and <laughs> more importantly, talking about uh, some of the policies that um, People's Policy Project is working on these days. All right. Thanks for having me. And I'd be happy to come back, talk about those things. Great. Be continued. We'll save those questions.